Oh, good afternoon. Welcome to the National Sea Grant Law Center's webinar series. We're so glad that you've joined us. Uh, today, um, our focus is on a litigation roundup. We thought that it would be interesting to provide a bit of information about some you know, recent court decisions, um, new cases of interest that have been filed, and give some updates on um, cases or um, challenges that we've been tracking. So Tara, next slide. So just a bit of an overview, we'll do a brief introduction to the Law Center, and then here is a sampling of the topics that we'll be covering. So we're trying to cover a range of topics of interest to Sea Grant personnel and programs from pollution to aquaculture and fisheries, water, um, protected species, um, and some others. So. Um, and I also want to let everyone know that we are recording this webinar and we will post it to our website um, by the end of the day. So if you need to leave early or have colleagues that weren't able to join us today, um, please uh, let them know that, that they can always watch a recording on our website. So for those who are new, um, the National Sea Grant Law Center is based at the University of Mississippi School of Law. We are one of 34 Sea Grant programs we were established to provide legal research, outreach, and education to the Sea Grant network. So we work with programs around the country. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And that's really the best way to stay up to date with what we're doing and what we're tracking and what we're sharing. But you can always reach out to any of us by email um, and visit our website to um, stay up to date as well, or sign up for our publications um, and uh, blog, sandbar, and other things. Next slide. So we also have a legal research service provided free of charge to Sea Grant programs. This is our advisory service. It is research only. We're prohibited from providing legal advice, but if you have questions in your programs related to law and policies issues, please contact us. We're here to help um, as we can. Next slide. Okay, so the first case that we're gonna cover today is a pollution case. So um, last week, uh, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the case of Guam versus the United States. Um, Guam is appealing a ruling by the U.S. Court of Appeals um, for the District of Columbia um, that Guam is barred from seeking contribution or getting money um, from the U.S. Navy for the cost of cleaning up the Ordot dump. This was a dump that the Navy created in the 1940s to dispose of chemical waste and munitions, which the Navy did until the 1970s. Uh, Guam took over responsibility for the dump in the 1950s um, and used it as a municipal waste dump at that time. In, the in 1983, after the passage of the uh, Superfund law, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency added the dump to the Superfund National Priorities List for cleanup and also named the Navy as a potentially responsible party for the cost of uh, re remediating, cleaning up the contamination. But what ha often happens is that the local landowners, the states, territories like Guam need to incur the cost of cleaning up the actual site and then they seek reimbursement or cost recovery from the federal government. So Guam filed a cost recovery claim against the United States government in 2017. The United States has been arguing that that claim is barred um, because Guam settled a clean water action um, related to the dump um, in 2004. And uh, the CERCLA, the Superfund law, has a three-year statute of limitations on bringing contribution claims if things have been settled, right? If there have been claims under CERCLA, uh, that are settled, you have three years to bring your cost recovery claim. 
So Guam is arguing that the U.S. deliberately tried to isolate itself or insulate itself from liability by pursuing a Clean Water Act claim against Guam instead of one under the Superfund law. And so it's a kind of a very esoteric uh, bit in the weeds uh, legal argument about whether this Clean Water Act settlement prevents Guam from recovering their uh, cost from the Navy. Um, it looked like in the oral arguments, Guam might have had the upper hand. The justices seemed favorable to some of their arguments, but you can never tell um, with the Supreme Court oral arguments. Um, a decision in favor of Guam um, is not likely to have much impact beyond um, kind of addressing this particular situation. Um, because today, the EPA, when they're negotiating these settlement agreements, actually expressly states the consequences of the settlement for these type of contribution actions. So it's unlikely to repeat itself because the EPA has already fixed the problems that were in its settlement documents. Um, but it's a very important one for Guam that's looking for this money. So next slide. So next up is public access. And um, I um, am excited about this one, not for the state of Maine, but just because the state of Maine has some of the most interesting public access, public trust cases. And so recently a new lawsuit was filed in Maine um, specifically to challenge a controversial decision by the, Marines, uh, by the Maine Supreme Court back in 1989. And so um, on April 22nd, a group of individuals from Maine, Massachusetts, and Connecticut filed a lawsuit against 10 individuals and beachfront property owners to try and overturn the Maine Supreme Court's ruling in Belle v. Town of Wells, which is more commonly known as the Moody Beach case. And so back in 1984, homeowners along Moody Beach in the town of well Wells accused local and state authorities of failing to treat misbehaving beach go or goers as trespassers. So they said, this is our beach, it's private property, and, and you should, we shouldn't have to deal with these, the public in front of our homes. So in a controversial, narrow four to three decision, the Maine Supreme Court ruled that the only public rights recognized in the intertidal area so the area between the high and the low water mark were those that were outlined in the colonial ordinance um, enacted in the 1640, 1640s, uh, which specifically says fishing, fouling, and navigating. So the colonial ordinance acknowledged private ownership of beachfront property to the low water mark. So this ruling meant that Maine coastal property owners own title, hold title, all the way to the low water mark with the public only having an easement to access that area for those three things. Um, the ruling has significantly impacted recreational access to beaches throughout Maine um, and has also led to some very interesting litigation. Um, in 2011, the Maine Supreme Court ruled that scuba diving is navigation and as a result, the public has the right to walk across the intertidal lands to reach the ocean for purposes of scuba diving. So it was kind of one of those, like, let's try to fit this square peg in a round hole to allow this activity to continue. Um, but then in 2019, the Maine Supreme Court ruled that rockweed harvesting, which is a, a type of seaweed algae that grows on the rocks um, in Maine, um, was not navigation fishing or fouling and therefore not protected by the public trust doctrine. And so beachfront property owners could prohibit that activity. So there's a lot of, you know, conflict over, you know, what actually is allowed in Maine by the public. And so um, this lawsuit is intentionally being uh, pursued and developed to challenge and try to get that um, 1989 case overturned. So this will be a really important one to watch if you're interested in public access um, in Maine. Next slide. So aquaculture, so we just have an update on aquaculture. For those um, that aren't in Florida or the Southeast, you might not um, be following this case, but it's an important one for um, aquaculture, fin fish aquaculture in federal waters. Uh, next slide. 
so um, Ocean Era, the aquaculture company has been seeking a permit for a, a pilot scale single net pen aquaculture system off the Gulf Coast of Florida. And so they applied to receive a permit from the EPA, a national pollution discharge elimination system permit under the Clean Water Act. That was issued by the EPA in October of 2020. Um, it would be for five years, um, and it is just to authorize this one net pen um, for a single growing cycle of um, fish to demonstrate um, the feasibility of the project. Um, it has been immediately challenged by uh, several environmental and animal rights uh, nonprofit organizations um, that are, you know, seeking uh, to uh, challenge any um, fin fish aquaculture in federal waters. So with Clean Water Act permits by the EPA, before you can go to federal court um, and have your case tried um, in court, you have to ex exhaust your administrative remedies, which means you have to work through the agency's administrative appeals process before you can file in court. So the groups have done that. They filed their appeal with the Environmental Appeals Board um, on October 30th of last year. Um, what has been interesting in this appeal is um, some of the procedural things that have happened as a result of the transition um, between the administrations. And so um, originally the Environmental Appeals Board had um, you know, they were looking at the case and they ordered the region to file a status report to the Environmental Appeals Board by March 31st. Um, and this happened in February um, because they said, well, this looks like it's raising questions of national importance. We're not sure that the region's decision is aligned with headquarters, um, and especially in light of the transition to the Biden administration. So we'd like a status update. On March 22nd, Region 4 sought and was granted a 60-day stay of proceedings because they requested more time. They said, we need more time to brief the agency, uh, new administration officials in headquarters and kind of get a sense of what's going on to report back. So that status report is due June 1st. Uh, so we're waiting to see what the Environmental Appeals Board says, um, but this case is far from over. Um, it will, um, if the EAB upholds the permit, um, it will definitely be challenged in federal court. So we'll just have to see um, what the outcome of this is before we know what the next steps are going to be. So next slide. All right, everyone. So hi, I'm Kathy. I'm going to talk about the next few cases that we have. Um, so Terry, you can go to the next slide. Um, so we just wanted to give an update on the Florida v. Water, the Florida v. Georgia water case um, that the Supreme Court just finally decided on. Um, but before I got into the actual case, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on kind of how interstate disputes work, um, just because they work a little differently than say the lawsuits that Stephanie just covered. So under the constitution, whenever two states are fighting with each other, the case has to go directly to the US Supreme Court. Um, and since the Supreme Court's an appellate court, what that does is they have to appoint what's called a special master to run kind of the trial-like process for the court to get all the um, evidence and um, initial hearings done. And so the special master runs that, you know, runs the process and then they generate a report that then gets sent back up to the Supreme Court to rule on. Um, and the other thing I wanted to note that's a little different is when two states are fighting against each other, you know, the state who's bringing the complaint has a much higher burden than a private plaintiff would have if it was a lawsuit between two just neighboring property owners. Um, the uh, Another major issue um, to think about when we're talking about Florida and Georgia is that they're both riparian states. And so what that means is under the riparian doctrine, each state does have a right to make a reasonable use of the water. Um, 
and so if Florida, I'll talk a little bit what Florida's complaints were, but if Florida comes to Georgia and says you have to kind of stop using water, um, Georgia does have a right to make a reasonable use of that surface water. And the map I have here just on the slide, I wanted to give a shout out. Um, Olivia, who's one of our Ocean and Coastal Law Fellows, has been working on kind of a series of fact sheets going over some um, water law basics. And so we can drop actually in the chat, once I get through this case, I can drop it. Um, just a direct link to that website um, of her fact sheet on riparianism, if you kind of want more background on what that means. Um, it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we can talk about today. But the final thing I wanted to talk about is all plaintiffs, when they bring a lawsuit, have to have standing. And what standing doctrine is really trying to get it is that um, we want the right person to be able to bring a case and um, be the right ones coming into court. And so the courts have always required plaintiffs to be able to show that they have an actual injury that the person they're suing caused that injury and that the court can redress that injury. And, you know, in other words, saying that the court can kind of give them the relief that will fix the problem. Um, and so the reason why I wanted to just point that out was in Florida versus Georgia, all three of those standing principles kind of came into play. So Terry, you can go to the next slide. So this is, um, you know, that I know the type is really, small on this, but I'll kind of go through. Um, but I wanted to put this in a timeline just to capture, you know, just how long just the Supreme Court case has been going on. So Florida, Georgia, and Alabama have been in tri-state water wars um, since the 70s. But this actual Supreme Court case, you know, first started back in 2013, so eight years ago. And so Florida filed um, a leave to file a complaint so with the Supreme Court. So even when two states are fighting with each other, they still have to kind of ask permission from the Supreme Court to even bring the case. So what happened was Florida went and said that Georgia's consuming too much water in the river systems that flow on down to Florida. And this caused two main injuries that they claimed. They said it's caused the oyster industry to collapse in the Apalachicola Bay, and that it's injuring river species that live along the river. So in 2014, the Supreme Court granted that motion of Florida to file the case, and they appointed a special master to kind of, again, run this kind of trial-like process. So in 2017, um, we get the first report from the special master. So the special master comes out with a report and says that the case should be dismissed because the Supreme Court can't fix Florida's harm. And the reason that the special master said that at that time was that they thought that the harm was really caused by the Army Corps of Engineers um, water release plan from upstream dams up by Atlanta. And so they thought that um, they couldn't fix, you know, what was wrong. So Georgia couldn't fix it, it had to be the core. And so we wait another year. Um, in January of 2018, the court, Supreme Court hears oral arguments on that special master's report. Um, in June, they decide, no, special master, you're wrong. You have to remand the case. Um, and they thought that the special master's standard was too high. Um, they said, you have to go back and actually look at this a little closer. So in 2019, we get the second second master report. And that now says, um, we need to dismiss because Florida hasn't shown causation at this time. And so just, you know, pretty quickly in 2021, in February, they finally heard oral arguments on that special master report. And then pretty quickly in April, the Supreme Court ruled nine to nothing to dismiss the case um, and say that they couldn't give um, the relief that Florida wanted to kind of curb Georgia's water use. And the reason that they really gave for that is they said that the oyster collapse was a you know, injury of serious magnitude. So they had that one standing factor, but they said Florida just could not, did not make the case that Georgia's use of water upstream was what caused the oysters um, to all die and the fishery to kind of collapse. And the court specifically, you know, said in the opinion, you know, we're not scientists, we have to go on by what the record is showing. 
Um, and, you know, there could be all these other reasons that the oysters collapsed, including um, they cited the fact that Florida had let um, the industry really harvest quite a lot in 2012 because of the um, in response to the oil spill um, and that they hadn't been reshelling as much as they had in the past. Um, so we're finally at an end um, to this after almost a decade. Um, so it's pretty much too bad, so sad for Florida. Um, they have, did not get any relief that they requested for the oyster fishery. So you can go to the next slide, Tara. And now we're gonna talk about just a series of um, lawsuits that we're seeing with protected species. So you can go next slide, Tara. Um, and so we had talked about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act back um, in, I think, January, February in one of our early mm -hmm. webinars this year, um, just because the Trump administration at the twilight of their time um, in office put out a new regulation under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, but where all this um, controversy is stemming from is that the act itself is written as a strict liability statute. And so that means if you kind of pursue, hunt, take, capture, kill a migratory bird that's protected, technically you're liable under the act. Um, and so there's been split in the court um, and interpreting the act about whether or not that includes an incidental take, which is just if you do one of those actions to the bird, but that wasn't the main purpose of what you were doing, can you still be liable under the act? And this has come up a lot with um, wind facilities, um, other oil and gas facilities that are kind of um, killing or kind of harassing birds. Um, should they kind of be liable under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act? And because of this split, the Obama administration at the last days of, that they were in office, the solicitor of the Department of Interior came out with an opinion that said incidental take is covered. The Trump administration rescinded that opinion and issued their own that said it isn't covered. Um, and that Trump opinion was actually challenged and struck down in court. But even though that happened, you know, right in January, the Trump administration made a new regulation basically that said incidental take wasn't covered. It was only gonna apply to actions directed at migratory birds, their nests or their eggs. So next slide, Tara. So what we've seen um, just in the last you know, couple months is in February 21st, the Biden administration withdrew the appeal to the court decision that found that Trump era opinion was unlawful. So they're no longer kind of challenging that decision. And they decided right at March 8th to permanently withdraw that opinion as well. So that opinion is no longer on the books. What still is on the book is the new regulation. So why the Biden administration, they, didn't, they delayed the effective date of the regulation um, from February to March. Um, since March 8, the new rule is in effect. And so what this meant is we still have three lawsuits that are continuing against the rule. Um, they've been consolidated in the Southern District of New York, which is the same court that held a Trump opinion um, which is basically the same thing as the current regulation was unlawful. So we're just kind of in a whole pattern still to see one, if the Biden administration will you know, rescind that regulation or if the courts will have to act and strike it down. And you can go to the next slide, Tara, and I think you're up next. Yep, thank you, Kathy. Um, so the first case that I'm gonna talk about is related to dusky shark bycatch. Um, so the dusky shark is a migratory shark that inhabits waters from southern New England to the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico to southern Brazil. So this species undertakes long migrations along the U.S. East Coast, and it was heavily fished at the end of the 20th century, which resulted in a drastic population decline for the species. Uh, so in 2000, um, the National Marine Fishery Service or NOAA Fisheries designated the species as, as a prohibited species. So that made it illegal for fishermen to possess, sell, take, or retain dusky sharks. 
And since that time, um, the agency has taken several regulatory measures to facilitate the species rebound, in particular through the um, highly migratory species fishery management plan. And so NOAA Fisheries adopted Amendment 5B to the fishery management plan, um, which includes several accountability measures to decrease um, dusky shark catches, including bycatch of dusky sharks. So the goal of the measures um, is to achieve a 35% reduction in mortality of the species by the year 2107. So it's a really long-term goal. Um, but in 2017, an environmental group, Oceana, challenged the bycatch data that the agency used for Amendment 5B. Um, specifically, the group claimed that the agency should have considered logbook data, which included a much higher number of bycatch um, instead of only observer data. So in 2019, uh, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia ruled in favor of Oceana. Um, the court basically said the agency didn't adequately explain why it only used the observer data. So the court remanded the regulation to NOAA Fisheries, ordering it to either include the omitted data in its analysis or better substantiate its decision to exclude it. So NOAA Fisheries um, then completed a comprehensive supplemental evaluation that supported its prior decision to rely on the observer data. Um, then Oceana came back and renewed its claim again in the federal district court, um, and the court issued another opinion in March of 2021. And this time the court uh, ruled in favor of NOAA Fisheries it found that um, the agency rationally justified its use of the data and it essentially deferred to the agency's scientific expertise in its decision not to use the logbook data to estimate the dusky shark bycatch. <clears throat> so ultimately the court denied Oceana's motion for summary judgment and granted NIMP's motion, cross motion for summary judgment. So that means that the accountability measures four or five B will remain in place for now. And so the next case is about a beluga whale import permit. So in August of 2020, uh, NOAA Fisheries issued a permit to Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut to import five captive born beluga whales from an amusement park in Ontario, Canada. <clears throat> so the Marine Mammal Protection Act prohibits the import and take of marine mammals However, um, NOAA Fisheries may issue permits for taking and importation for the purposes of scientific research, public display, photography for educational or commercial purposes, or enhancing the survival or recovery of a species or stock. So the import of depleted populations or populations that have fallen below their optimum sustainable population levels is subject to additional criteria under the MMPA. Um, the parents of the whales identified in this permit are from a population designated as depleted by NOAA fisheries. So there were um, additional, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, things in place in the permit. The permit specifically prohibited breeding of any of the imported whales. Um, it also stipulated that NOAA fisheries office of protected resources must approve the transport of any of the imported whales to Georgia Aquarium, which is partially funding the purchase of the whales. And then it must also approve the disposition of the whales at the end of the research. So in September, environmental groups filed a complaint in federal district court challenging the permit. Um, the lawsuit claimed that um, the permit violates the importation research and procedural requirements of the MMPA. Um, it violates the National Environmental Policy Act by um, not analyzing the harms that the permit would cause beluga whales. So <clears throat> we're watching this case to kind of see what happens next. So now I'm going to pass it to Zach, who's going to talk about fisheries. That's right. Thanks, Tara. I have uh, one case that I'll be covering. It's called Burke v. Coggins. It's a case uh, that was recently decided just a couple months ago out of the district court for the District of Columbia. This is a case uh, that the saga spans a few years. It goes back to 2015 
when the Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council proposed a rule that would have suspended the drift gillnet swordfish fishery in California and Oregon if it were to exceed a limit or a hard cap on harm caused to certain turtle and marine mammal species within a two-year period. Harm here, for anyone who isn't familiar, refers to a death or any sort of injury, so pretty broad umbrella. And uh, that rule, that proposal was published in the Federal Register in October of 2016. So proposed in, in 2015, published as a proposal in the Federal Register in October 2016. Uh, in response to some comments that were received in the Federal Register that alleged some significant short-term economic impacts that hadn't previously been identified, NIMS tried to withdraw the proposal. This was in 2017. Um, however, Oceana, uh, an environmental nonprofit, sued to have the proposal published as a final rule in the Federal Register. And it did end up winning that lawsuit on a procedural technicality. So um, I should mention at this point that the reason why NIMS tried to get that proposal withdrawn is because a lot of these comments allege these significant harms to sword fishermen, swordfish fishermen, uh, and National Standard 7 of the Magnus and Stevens Act specifically prohibits any uh, unnecessary economic burdens on fisheries or, or participants in fisheries where practicable. So as, uh, as a result of comments received in the Federal Register, NIMS decided that this rule, the hard caps rule, was in conflict with National Standard 7, tried to withdraw it, but Oceana won on a technicality, and that rule gets published in the Federal Register, that proposal, as a final rule, as it was written uh, originally. And then there becomes another round of lawsuits. And uh, this all comes down um, to agency deference. Uh, those of you who, who follow a lot of our webinars or um, but might not be lawyers will probably recognize that agency deference carries a lot of weight in law. Uh, courts generally can't replace their own judgment for the judgment of an agency. So there's only certain circumstances where they can do that. Uh, and what was really important in this specific case was that the judge ultimately determined that it was the agency's determination that the proposal was in conflict with National Standard 7 that deserved deference. Not the original proposal, not the re-proposal, but rather that determination that there was conflict with National Standard 7. And it was that determination uh, that ultimately won the day. So this uh, district court in the District of Columbia, uh, it ultimately sided against Oceana and it was in favor not only of the fishermen's groups, but also interestingly enough with NIMS who was still on the case and supported over turning um, or, or setting aside this proposal. And so as far as we can tell for now, the rule is, uh, is DOA, it's not going anywhere. However, at least per the court opinion, NIMFS has indicated that it is going to revisit the rule or that it's at least interested in revisiting the issue of bycatch in swordfish uh, drift gill nets. And uh, so there might be some action with this moving forward. And just to, to briefly point out, uh, in the slide you can see not only the picture of a swordfish, but also at the bottom there is a diagram that indicates what a drift gill net is, how it differs from a set gill net. And if you're interested in learning more about this case or about some of the legal controversy surrounding drift gill nets, there is uh, an article that we published about this case on the blog that you can check out if you would like. And so with that, I will hand it over to Olivia to talk about some oil and gas litigation. Thanks, Zach. Yes, I'll be talking about um, some updates on oil and gas activities. Um, so in April, the Ninth Circuit Court dismissed an Arctic offshore drilling case. And in that case, the court was reviewing a decision about whether a president has authority under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act 
to allow drilling after the lands have previously been withdrawn from drilling and leasing. So one provision of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act states that um, a president may withdraw from disposition any of the unleased lands of the Outer Continental Shelf. So President Obama in 2016 exercised his authority under this provision and moved to withdraw drilling indefinitely from large areas of the Arctic and Atlantic oceans. Um, in 2017, President Trump issued an executive order that directed the Department of Interior to review restrictions on drilling um, and ultimately open them up for leases for fossil fuel exploration. So several groups uh, brought a case over this action, including the League of Conservation Voters. And they argued that because President Obama had previously withdrawn the area indefinitely, then President Trump could not reinstate drilling. So a federal district court in Alaska heard this case um, and they issued a decision that said Trump could not rescind this indefinite bill ban on drilling. And this decision was appealed. And while this appellate um, procedure was taking place in January of this year, um, President Biden issued executive order uh, 13990 and this blocked drilling in Arctic waters and essentially reinstated most of the Obama era restrictions. So the Ninth Circuit um, considered this court, this case in light of President Biden's executive order. And the court held that um, the case was moot because the challenge terms, which were, you know, could President Trump reinstate drilling had already been abolished um, by President Biden's executive order. So that means that currently there can be no oil and gas drilling and leasing in these areas. Thanks, next slide. Um, so the next update is not a case, but a decision um, from NOAA. Um, and NOAA upheld an Oregon consistency objection. So the Jordan Cove Energy Project was a proposed project that included the construction of a liquefied natural gas terminal, um, a 229 mile pipeline and a compressor station that would start on the coast of Oregon and extend throughout the state and connect to pipelines serving the Rocky Mountain and Western Canadian regions. Um, so a pipeline project like this has to go through a lot of environmental review and um, permitting processes. And one of these requirements is it must receive a consistency certification. Under the Coastal Zone Manage Act, Management Act, states have authority to reject projects that are not consistent with state coastal management plans. Um, and this review is often called the consistency review. So the state of Oregon went through this review for the project and ultimately rejected the certification um, because they found it was not consistent with the Oregon Coastal Management Plan. Um, so the companies appealed this decision to NOAA and um, NOAA can only override a state's consistency objection if it finds that the proposed activity is consistent with the purposes of the Coastal Zone Management Act or if it is necessary for national security. Um, and generally the agency will use a three-part test analysis to weigh some of the conservation values with the necessity values of the project. Um, and also past precedent dictates that without sufficient evidence in the record, NOAA will decide the case in favor of the state. Um, and that's what happened in this decision. The record did not contain enough evidence. Um, so NOAA could not even get to this three-part um, test analysis and NOAA rejected the appeal and ruled in favor of the state. So some of the reasoning from NOAA was that the record lacked information about habitat um, for over 30 listed and endangered species. The record lacked information on, on effects to cultural and historic resources, and it did not contain enough information about um, concerns about tribal consultation policies. Um, so this means that the project likely will not move forward it can't move forward without this certification. Um, NOAA's decision um, is considered a final federal agency action under the requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act. So this means that a case um, could be brought to court to hear um, the merits of this decision and this procedural um, process. Um, but as, as far as I know, um, the companies have not brought a case yet. 
Uh, thank you. Next slide. All right, so if anyone has any questions, the, the chat is open. Um, the fact sheets are pasted in the side. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and we will catch you next time. Thank you.